power that you like to give yourself credit for. Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Caitlin. I upload a whole bunch of different types of videos on this channel, mainly surrounding true crime and psychological cases, as well as a little bit of university and lifestyle sprinkled in where I can. And today I'm back discussing something known as the Jeff Davis 8, which refers to a case which kind of summarises eight murders of eight different women around a four year period. All of these murders took place in a place in Louisiana and they're all unsolved to this day, but they're all believed to be kind of tied together in quite an intricate way. So I'm gonna go into a bit of detail and discuss all of the links and the potential connections between all of the cases at a later point in the video. So if you wanna hear about the case, then keep on watching. And I'm just gonna go into a very quick disclaimer as per usual. If you're not new here, then I'm sure you will be used to this by now. I will always have a disclaimer in the description if you wanna check any of it out. But kind of in summary, I apologize if I get anything wrong, mispronounce anything, miss out any piece of information, anything along those lines. I'm not trying to offend anyone or do anyone an injustice. I'm here for educational purposes, just sharing with you what I found on the internet. The Jeff Davis 8, also sometimes referred to as the Jennings 8, like I said, is the name given to a number of unsolved murders that took place between the years of 2005 and 2009 in a place called Jefferson Davis Parish in Louisiana. In the space of these four years, the bodies of eight different women were found in the local swamp land and also canals in the areas of Jennings in Louisiana. They were all known to have ties to drug rings, prostitution, rings as well as the local police department. Usually in these types of videos, as you will know if you've watched any of my previous cases that I've discussed, you will know that I typically will go into each of the individual victims. My focus will be on the victims, who they were, what happened to them in each individual case. However, in this particular case, there isn't a lot of information known on each individual victim, just um, kind of vague overviews on what happened to them, mostly due to the fact that the majority of the victims were found in such a badly decomposed state that a lot of authorities didn't really know exactly what happened to them. So I will go into as much detail as I can about each of the individual victims. Mostly I just have a list of their names and a lot of them kind of were believed to have died in the same way. So I'll go into as much detail as I can find available. Just know that I'm not intentionally skipping out any of the details on each of these individual victims. It's either um, not available or just not known in general. First victim in this case was 28 year old Loretta Lewis. She was found on May the 20th, 2005 by a fisherman and she was found floating in a river. And then the list of victims in order following this case are as follows. 30 year old Ernestine Marie Daniels Patterson, 21 year old Kristen Gary Lopez, 26 year old Whitney Dubois, 23 year old Lasonia Muggy Brown, 24 year old Crystal Shea Benoit Zeno, 17 year old Brittany Gary, and then the final victim was 26 year old Nicole Gilroy. Nicole Gilroy, the last victim known in the Jeff Davis 8 case, was found in the year of 2009 and her body was found just off the side of Interstate 10. Like I said, the majority of these victims were sadly found in too late a stage of decomposition for authorities to be able to determine their cause of death and what happened to them just before they died. However, 30-year-old Ernestine Patterson, as well as 23-year-old Lasonia Brown, were both found with their throats slit. And the investigators working on each of the cases at the time voiced their opinions. That they believed that the likely scenario for the cause of death of the other victims was that they died as a result of asphyxiation. It was the investigation into Lasonia Brown's death in particular that introduced a number of intricate kind of connections and links between each of the victims that may not have necessarily been obvious to police at the time uh, originally. So it was when they started realising that there were a few that were related as well as a lot of them kind of ran in the same rings, uh, the same circles, that they began to kind of understand that there might have been something linking these eight women. As I said, it turns out that the majority of these women, virtually all of them, were very close acquaintances with, um, in particular, Kristen Gary Lopez and Brittany Gary were actually blood-related cousins. As well as this, Brittany Gary and Crystal Bonoy, another one of the victims, were actually housemates. And aside from these immediate connections, all of these women were linked through a history of drug abuse, prostitution rings, as well as bouts of poverty in the same area. A strange addition into the investigation of each of these women was that at some point in each of the eight women's lives, they each served as police informants. They were kind of snitches in a sense. They told police um, any updates on local drug rings, drug gangs, as well as prostitution rings, basically anything the police needed to know that they couldn't get a hold of themselves. At some point in each of these women's lives, they served as informants. And in most cases, each of the victims were informants 
on the previous victim's death after they died before they died themselves, if that makes sense. So for example, when one of the women would turn up dead, another one of the women would act as an informant for the police. They would tell them everything about the victim, who she was, any information they needed to know. But then mysteriously, this next, the one that was acting as an informant would turn up dead as well. Kristen Gary Lopez actually served as a witness to the shooting of a local drug dealer. His name was Leonard Crotchet. Uh, he was shot by the police, as well as a number of other suspects in the Jeff Davis 8 case. Uh, when police learned of their location, essentially they shot a bunch of these suspects. And Kristen Gary Lopez witnessed one of these shootings herself. One of these suspects that was attacked by police when they learned of their location was a man named Alvin Bootsy Lewis, who was the father to Whitney Du Bois, who was one of the victims, the father to her son, as well as the brother-in-law of another one of the victims, Loretta Chazon Lewis, the first victim. Because I'm sure a lot of you are a little bit confused right now. It is quite all over the place. I'm trying to sort of give you um, a basic summarized understanding of how each of the victims can be linked together, but it is all, all over the place, pretty much. It's such a spider web of connections that it's quite hard to simplify. But as I'm sure a lot of you can probably gather, there is a lot, a lot, a lot of public speculation about the unknown facts of this case. In particular, the families of the victims themselves actually believe that the local police department were in some way involved in the murders of these eight women. Amid this speculation, a number of interviews actually surfaced and came into the public eye that featured witnesses of a number of different crimes in relation to the Jeff Davis eight murders that seemed to implicate a number of members of the local police department in having something in some way to do with the murders. A man in particular named Warren Gary, he was serving as the local sheriff's office chief criminal investigator at the time. He was directly accused by a witness of buying a truck that was later used to transport one of the victims' bodies of the Jeff Davis 8 victims. So this was a direct accusation, a direct implication of a witness who claimed to see him actually buying this truck that was later known to transport one of the bodies. And so in light of all this new information coming forward gradually, it began more and more obvious that there was a deeper and deeper link between the Jeff Davis 8 victims and the police department. Anyone knew about, like no one knew about all of these secret links and there was some sort of cover up at hand. There's so, so many theories about what could have potentially happened to these women, purely because at the time when the bodies were appearing, it just seemed like they were appearing out of nowhere and it was just random attacks of these poor women were being targeted for no known reason. So in light of all these sort of updates about these intricate underlying connections between the women, there are so many theories. So these can range anywhere from um, them being linked to the police department, so the police department being blamed because they had actually murdered them themselves for knowing something, maybe seeing them do something they shouldn't have done, i.e. Um, attack someone that they shouldn't have attacked and so these women were witnesses to crimes or they were potentially targeted by gang members as a result of their informant status with the police. So most of them do stem from the belief that in some way or another the police department are to blame for their deaths. Despite these claims being made in regards to the police department being to blame for these murders, there have been uh, a couple of arrests in relation to the deaths of these eight women. First was a man named Frankie Richards. He was a local suspected drug dealer and he also owned a local strip club. He had been caught with an admission of having drug abuse problems and also having quite a few links, so um, related in some way or another with the majority of these victims. And it was also reported that he had sexual relations with quite a few of the victims in relation to prostitution rings. During the investigation into Kristen Gary Lopez's death in particular, it was also discovered that Frankie Richards was one of the last few people to see her alive as well so all of this kind of just seemed to implicate him in some sense to the point where police department decided that it was best to bring him in as quite a high up suspect and there was uh, an incident we'll say there wasn't a lot of information on it there was a claim made by a woman who seemed to have knowledge she claimed that she had knowledge of the local police department actually covering up mishandling information intentionally hiding some information in, re in regards to um, Kristen Gary Lopez's murder case because of an order given to them by Frankie Richards himself. So if this were true, it seems as though Frankie Richards was, yes, a suspect, but he had quite 
high up contacts he had quite a lot of power over the local police department but it also does suggest that the police department are particularly corrupt. The next two people that were arrested as suspects in the cases was a man named Byron Chad Jones and also a man named Lawrence Nixon who was the cousin of one of the victims, Lasonia Brown. Again there isn't a load of detail on it on their arrest because kind of nothing came about of it but for a short period of time from what I can gather they were arrested and charged with secondary murder in relation to the death of Ernestine Patterson, one of the first couple of victims but I believe it was poor procedural uh, approaches carried out by the police department that led to them not actually uh, testing the crime scene in relation to Ernestine Patterson's death and there was no sign of any blood evidence and ultimately it led to the two men being cleared of all charges because no testing was done to find any sort of solid evidence. There was a detailed book that was released, it was called Murder in the Bayou in which an author or the author investigated a lot of the claims and theories into uh, the co potential cover-up, the claims made about the police being corrupt in relation to these cases, which is very interesting. I can barely kind of touch on the surface of all of the claims made in this case, because like I said, a lot of it isn't available to kind of just the general public. You do have to do a lot of digging and it is quite hard to d distinguish between what's actual general theories and actual evidence and what is just speculation. One thing that was discussed in this book in particular though that is very, very strange and it kind of it really irked me a little bit, it kind of made me feel a bit strange, um, but I thought I'd include it because it's quite a discussion point. So one of the victim's mothers allegedly claimed that she was visited by a policeman in her home at some point, and this officer had been the one that told her that her daughter was found dead. And what was particularly strange about this was that she hadn't even been aware that her daughter was missing. There was no official claim made that her daughter had been missing, and so it was strange for a policeman to appear at her home and say that they'd found her and she was dead. Which does kind of suggest the timeline between them being missing and being found dead was very accelerated. There wasn't a lot of time that she'd gone missing because her mother hadn't even been aware that she was missing. And the mother remained quite sceptical after him saying that her daughter had been killed. And so she decided to ask him how he knew it was her daughter. And he replied by saying, that he had been the one to identify her through a distinctive tattoo that she had on an intimate area of her body. And again, the woman remained quite unsettled by his answers. Uh, she inquired further, so she asked him how he knew about this um, private part tattoo, to which he replied by saying, I have my ways. Now, I don't know about you, I'm sure it does kind of sit funny with you, it just seems really creepy to me. Um, and so it does seem to implicate this police officer as knowing more than he's letting on. And people have since speculated that it's a likely indication of a sexual relationship at one time or another between some of the uh, local police department working on the case and some of the victims. If this isn't a sure sign, then I don't know what is. So again, majorly supports the idea of some sort of deeper connection and um, police cover-up potentially. Another strange incident linking to this case was um, was when a local drug dealer who had been offered protection under the local police department, so he was being protected by the local de police department, he had turned up to one of the victim's family's houses um, and offered to pay for the funeral of the victim. However, at this point when he had done so, the family had not been aware that she had died. And aside from this obviously being quite a jarring experience, they also wouldn't they weren't sure why he would offer, a stranger would offer to pay for the funeral of their daughter or their granddaughter, um, who they didn't know, like I said, had died. There were also a few reports then later released claiming that witnesses had knowledge of a number of the members of the local police department having some sort of sexual encounters with the majority of the victims at different points in their lives, mostly because of them being prostitutes as well as, allegedly, while they had been in police custody for a number of their respective crimes, whether that be drug-related or anything, at some point in the majority of their lives they had been in police custody and apparently had sexual relations with a number of members of the local police department. And this might seem kind of straightforward, um, you know, if this is the case then why haven't the police department been implicated more directly, why hasn't something come about of this? and mostly because something strange would always happen to these witnesses. So for example, these witnesses that claim to have knowledge of the police um, having sexual relations with the women while they were in their custody came from a number of witnesses who were working in the jail at the time where they were being held. 
and when they would come forward to blow the whistle on these particular police officers, these same witnesses would later become fired from their jobs. They would lose their jobs or punished or have their lives mysteriously ruined by some unknown person. So again, does this not all just point towards a police cover-up that runs deeper than anyone knows? In general, the police investigators working on each of the cases did very little to uh, collect DNA evidence, to collect anything that they could potentially preserve and look back on, and so it made it extremely difficult to prove anything at all. And many think that this is an intentional accident in a sense, making it easier and more convenient for them to not be able to implicate anyone because it was them themselves. And going back to something that I mentioned earlier on in the video, uh, one of the earliest sort of hints at the police cover-up theory, one of the underlying beliefs came from the order of the victim's deaths. So in a lot of the sense it came about that when one would die, the next would provide information on that victim, perhaps a little bit too much information and uh, she knew, potentially suggesting that she knew a little bit too much about the police department and then she would be the next victim and so on and so on. So like I said, it seems as though these victims were pressed for information to see how much they actually knew and if they knew a little bit too much they would mysteriously become the next victim in the Jeff Davis 8. There was a case in which one victim had told um, a close acquaintance of hers and the acquaintance shared uh, this information after she had turned up dead. Uh, apparently one of the witnesses had witnessed a off-duty police officer working for this local police department killing a man inside of her home while she was hiding and she had basically been getting high inside her home when this police officer turned up and brutally attacked a man but hadn't seen her as she'd been hiding once he arrived and not long after this she had ended up one of the victims in the Jeff Davis 8 case. So that's everything that I kind of have to discuss. As I've said throughout this video at multiple points, I've only been able to come across sort of extracts of books and pieces of research. There isn't a lot that I can find and it is a bit of a spider web. It's all quite confusing to try and collectively piece together. So if this is something that you haven't found, um, that you don't think I've gone into enough detail on anything, I apologise. I have done the best I can to piece together what I could find. But definitely check out the books. There's quite a few books that have been released, but in particular Murder in the Bayou is one that I kept coming across, kept propping up, so it seems to have quite a strong link to everything. It seems to go into a lot of detail, so that's something you should check out if you want to investigate further. Let me know your thoughts down below. To me, it all just seems to point towards this police cover-up, which isn't unlikely. It does happen, um, but let me know your thoughts. So. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you found this interesting and I will see you guys soon for another video. Thanks for watching, bye.